On the 24th day of October, Halloween gave to me 24 space vampire snogging, 23 bloody canoes, 22 pool corpses, 21 groovy ashes, 20 Japanese giallos, 19 kung fu vampires, 18 haunted marches, 17 eternal lonelinesses, 16 cursed VHS tapes, 15 spectral snapshots, 14 mothers murdering, 13 prices bleeding, 12 models dying, 11 Bettys baking, 10 prices burning, 9 seagulls pecking, 8 scientists sneaking, 7 gold ones shooting, 6 psychic scamming, 5 naked witches, 4 alien spelunking, 3 UFO abductions, 2 deputy so-and-sos, and a masked hawk being creepy. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of the 31 Days of Halloween. I am Bo, I am your your companion, uh, your co-pilot for this, uh, what, what amounts to the last week of the Halloween season, which is, is sad, but we are going to talk about some, uh, some real bangers moving forward, and we are going to start with a hometown favorite of mine. Uh, if you are keeping score at home, this is the movie that falls into the category of a movie I love. Uh, it is not without its problems, so we will talk about that, but of course I'm talking about the movie Life Force uh, by Toby Hooper. It is uh, one of the movies, along with Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, that Toby Hooper did for Canon Films, the uh, Golden Glo Globus uh, production company, that helped bankrupt <laughs> that company because Life Force is nothing if not expensive. And it, it's a weird film in that it's sort of everything Toby Hooper is known for in the sense that it deals with these kind of primal horrors uh, and also, you know, this is on the heels of Poltergeist and so there's an element of, of like sophistication in the filmmaking. You know, like this movie looks good. And, and has some really great actors up to and including, uh, like, you, you've got uh, Patrick Stewart and uh, who else? Like, you know, Peter Firth uh, is, is in this. Uh, Matilda May is the, you know, I think it, it's like and featuring or, or presenting Matilda May or something like that. But, you know, you've got like Michael Gothard and uh, John Hallam and... I mean, it's just a murderer's row of, like, you know, British character actors. And then Steve Rails back in Matilda May. And Matilda May, I think, was French? Um, yeah, a, a dancer originally. And I, as, as far as I know, this was her first, uh, or one of her first major films um, outside of France. Uh, of course, Toby Hooper... Uh, like, it's interesting because the movie um, was originally based on a book called uh, The Space Vampires. And uh, T Toby Hooper wanted that title for a long time because it, it sort of indicates the schlocky nature of the film. But uh, Canon Films was like, no, 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 we want everyone to go see this as opposed to the weirdos that this was intended for. And so, as a result, you know, this was meant to be this kind of broadly seen film. They changed the title to Life Force to make it a little more palatable than something like The Space Vampires. And the end result of that is, I, I think this ends up being a movie that is aimed at almost no one, but it found its audience. And so, let's... For a moment, let us look at what the plot of uh, Life Force, a.k.a. the Space Vampires, is. Um, because it's a a fairly interesting story, and I've never read the book that it's based on, and I should. I should go back and read that. I think that would be fun. But the, the story is Steve Railsback and a team of you know astronauts are up in a space shuttle. They're investigating um, a comet, and in the you know, uh, Corona or the, the tale of that comet, they find this, sh this ship 
And they go in to investigate, and they find all these, like, desiccated bat creatures. And then uh, three human figures in these sort of glass cases that they call some sort of, like, force field. But it, it looks like glass coffins. And there are two dudes and then one woman, Matilda May, all of them naked. And they end up uh, bringing all of the coffins, you know, these uh, three figures in force fields back on the, uh, the ship to return them to Earth. Which seems like a mistake already. It seems like there would be protocol that's like, you know what? Leave that there. We're going to send somebody else along and, and check that out. But... They, uh, they instead decide to take it on the ship. Uh, the ship uh, ends up being discovered with, uh, like, all burned up and stuff. And eventually, Steve Railsback is found in a, like, life pod, that uh, an escape pod that he's taken down to Earth. And so the question is, what happened on this spaceship? Also... When the ship was recovered with the rest of the crew dead or missing, they found these three, you know, force field glass coffins and brought these, you know, what we will learn to be space vampires uh, to to Earth and to, uh, um, you know, a, a secure military installation where they can be studied. Only uh, the woman in particular, Matilda May, is not asleep. And wakes up and, and sucks the life force out of this dude. And it ends up, like, escaping. And the space vampires portion of this is just that, right? Like, the uh, the original space vampire, Matilda May, sucks the life force out of somebody. They get all desiccated. But they can then suck the life force out of somebody else and return to normal. But you have to do that about every two hours. And so... You know, as a result, it creates this sort of geometric uh, infection that can destroy the world in a short amount of time. And certainly London, uh, as is the case here. And so Steve Railsback uh, has this weird psychic connection with Matilda May. And they use him to try to find her and stop this infection before it can spread. But it turns out that Matilda May was leading them on kind of a wild goose chase so that... Um, she could allow for this infection to spread. Meanwhile, the ship they found comes to Earth, begins, uh, you know, uh, orbiting around the planet over London and collecting all of these souls uh, that are being reaped as a result of Matilda May uh, and, and her vampire gang. And uh, at one point, Steve Railsback, you know, gives us the skinny of like, they've done this to many planets before they've been here on this planet that's what gave rise to the uh the the legends of vampires in the first place and this time though they're just going to wipe out you know sort like i said certainly all of london but potentially all of the world and um uh, and there, there's some question of like is steel steve railsback being used uh by these creatures it is the Matilda May creature actually connected to him at, at some deeper level. Um, that seems to be the case where, you know, she's like, join us. Like you could be a space vampire with us question mark. That's never really entirely clear, but that's sort of the offer she is making him is that he, he can be with her and live with, live forever. So that's the premise. And you know, then they get back to London and London is in shambles as these space vampires slash zombies run rampant, suck at the life force out of everybody they can get their hands on. And, uh, and they're, you know, once they go, uh, their life forces are sucked up and transmitted to the ship where presumably it's going to bring all of these vampires back to life or something. Um, that again, not super clear, uh, what the end result of that is other than they are collecting that life force. And so Peter Firth, uh, who is, a special forces, uh, SFS, something like that, RFS, something. Her Majesty's special forces. Um, he is uh, tasked with uh, helping Steve Railsback get to the bottom of this, but sort of becomes the main hero of the film, having located this iron sword that he can use to 
uh, you know, serve as a stake, uh, if you will, to to kill these space vampires. And um, so that's the basic premise, and you know, everything kind of works out in the end. Uh, C. Rails back and Matilda May end up uh, being murdered together. But let's talk about what everyone really cares about with this movie. One is uh, the fact that you've got Matilda May completely nude for the lion's share of this movie. And at the risk of sounding like a horrible chauvinist, um, she is this gorgeous woman who is in the all together through much of the film. And, you know, she says herself that like she is a fantasy, a, a perfection of the female form that was taken from Steve Railsback's mind. And that is why he is so drawn to her that, you know, she is truly his fantasy woman. But more than that, uh, as far as a film goer goes, it's kind of strange to see a movie at this budget that is kind of using this grindhouse tactic of, you know, like we're just going to have this beautiful French dancer completely naked for a good portion of the film as a means of like titillation and, and entertainment. And, you know, it's never, I mean, you can argue the exploitative nature of that. Uh, but Matilda May seemed fine with it in retrospect, and it doesn't seem like she was harassed on set or anything like that. It was just a thing that they wanted to do in this movie, and as a result, um, you know, it, it is kind of known for the fact that it's got this just drop-dead gorgeous woman uh, running around naked for the, the grand uh, portion of her time on screen. And in that way, Life Force is a you know certainly an overtly sexual film and it plays with the ideas of the sexuality of the vampires you know you have to insert something into them to kill them uh they are sucking something out of you uh you know it, it's all these kind of sexual connotations and and denotations and uh the fact that you know the movie i think understands that um, you know, it, it's sort of plain with it. It's not quite parody or satire. It's more tongue in cheek than that of like, you know, vampires at their root are, are sort of sexual creatures of legend. And so let's just turn that to 11 and make it like, it, this is the natural extension of those hammer movies where you had buxom young women practically spilling out of their tops. As the Hammer movies went on, you got to see a little bit of nudity. But, you know, this is Toby Hooper saying like, yeah, 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 let's do a Hammer movie. But enough of that, you know, coy, like, oh, will you, will she ever pop out of that bustle? Uh, it's just like, nope, here she is. She's totally naked the entire time. And, and that's what this movie is, largely. is It's a Hammer film. Um, you know, it's got... The, this cast of British actors, and I think Hooper himself said that he wanted to make a Hammer movie, and and this is uh, of that ilk. Um, it's got vibes of like Quartermass and the Pit, and and that sort of thing of that you know end of days in London kind of scenario, and so that's what it is. It, like like I said, it's made for a very specific audience that loves schlocky Hammer movies, and wondered what it would be like if you saw one of those with an incredible budget and effects done by the team that did Star Wars. And this is that. And the, and that's the other thing. I, aside from the rampant nudity, the effects work is really good, whether it's like the matte paintings or the practical uh, effects work. There's some really great, like, zombie dude uh, practical effects. Towards the end, it gets a little dicey because you're doing it on a, on scale. And everybody just looks like they've got like a bad wig and some, you know, latex on their face. But when you get the close-ups of the dudes who have been sucked dry and they're moving around, they're these, you know, animatronic uh, puppets. Uh, those look really cool. And there's one scene in particular where you see one of them like running uh, full speed at this, you know, cell door and just explodes into a puff of dust when, when it hits it. And that's really neat. Um, you know, there's a great scene where uh, th this blood is taken from a, a victim. Like Matilda May can kind of jump bodies or her soul can. 
uh, and she inhabits the bodies of a couple of different humans, including Patrick Stewart, which is fantastic because you get a moment where Steve Railsbick and uh, Patrick Stewart share a kiss, uh, which is just something you don't expect to see in this movie is, you know, uh, uh, Jean-Luc Picard making out with Steve Railsback, but that certainly happens in this movie. <laughs> Number one, I'm going to second base. And uh, so there's that element of it. And uh, but in that scene or shortly after that scene, there's this moment where um, Matilda May's vampire speaks to Steve, Steve Railsback as this blood creature that forms out of the blood of the body of a victim. And it's really cool. It's a really neat effect. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff in it and all the visual effects, uh, you know, as far as these souls being collected and you know, the lights and uh, making the whooshing sounds and, and scattering newspapers in the city as all these souls are flying around and stuff. All of that stuff looks great. It's really good. And it's all in service, though, of such a B-movie plot. And that's kind of the beauty of Life Force, and it's also the disconnect. Because for someone to spend this much time and money to make something of this quality you would think it would be a little bit more highbrow or more of a real movie. And and not that it's not a real movie. It's just so weird. And it's so particular. And it's, like I said, you, you just have to be a fan of Hammer movies and the Quatermass movies and that sort of thing to really understand what the movie is and what its roots are and what, what the genesis of it is and, and what it's trying to do. And once you know that and get on board with the fact like, oh, this is going to be a big schlocky mess of a movie, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And that's what it is. It's a big schlocky mess of a movie that's a lot of fun. And, but how on earth could you expect an audience at the time in particular that's being marketed this film as like, you know, from the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the effects team, what did Star Wars comes this new vision of horror and you sit down in the audience and you get, you know, naked space vampires and Patrick Stewart making out with Steve rails back. And you're like, what is this? This is not what I was sold at all. And I don't know how I feel about it yet. And it's really taken me a long time to come around to the fact that I just love life force. I really do. I find it incredibly entertaining. I don't. So here is my biggest complaint with the movie other than, you know, the the overarching complaint, uh, which isn't a complaint of mine, but just a more of a warning that if you have never seen Life Force, go in expecting a schlocky Hammer movie and you are going to be delighted at how much money somebody spent on making one of those. Uh, if you are looking for a serious contemplation about space vampires, then you are not getting it from this movie, that's for sure. But uh, more than that, it's the, the, the complaint I have is that Steve Railsback, I just don't think is very good in this movie. I just, you know, he's one of those actors that if you love him, great. I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm saying his performances have never blown me away. Uh, I have, I've long considered him to be not a great performer. Uh, and I think the fact that the movie rests on his shoulders so much of the time, I just don't think he carries it. And so it's up to, you know, characters like Peter Firth and Frank Finlay as Falada and Patrick Stewart and Michael Gothard and like all the, these great actors around him to kind of lift the movie up uh, when he falls down. And, you know, if you like Steve Railsback, then you're going to love this even more than I do. Uh, but I kind of like it despite him. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's my big complaint with, it. I wish there were a different actor in the, in the rails back role. And I think I would love this movie a little bit more, but I still love it. I still, uh, you know, I think this movie is absolutely terrific. That's enough about life force. You should absolutely watch life force this Halloween season. If you've never seen it, just, just to have that in your cinematic vocabulary, because it is so weird. And, and if that doesn't sell you on it, it's written uh, partially by Dan O'Bannon, the guy who did Return of the Living Dead and Alien and all that stuff. So, you know, it, it's got some great ideas in it. And uh, also, uh, 
written by Dan Jacoby, co-written by that who did like uh, Arachnophobia and uh, but also like Invaders from Mars for Toby Hooper and uh, what else? Vampires, John Carpenter's Vampires, uh, that Blue Thunder movie with Roy Scheider. Anyway, you know, has, has written some stuff that's pretty good. Um, also some stuff not so good. He did Death Wish 3, which is, you know, not great. Anyway, watch Life Force. Life Force is, is terrific. Uh, all right, that's going to do it this time around. Uh, as always, if you are listening to this on the Legion podcast feed, please, 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 uh, I in, implore you, uh, subscribe to the Dark Parade, which is the uh, show that I do on the weekly. And I think that you will uh, enjoy it. If you enjoy this kind of thing, uh, there's a lot of like deep dives and that sort of thing on movies and found footage movies and all kinds of stuff. So I think you will get uh, your money's worth, uh, which of course is zero dollars um, <laughs> to subscribe to that. But also, uh, if you're listening to this on the Dark Parade feed, then be sure that you are checking out the Legion podcast feed where you can see any uh, or listen to any number of shows. Uh, including Hello, This is the Doom Show and The the Butcher Shop and, uh, oh, geez, I'm going to forget something uh, terrific, Cinema Psyops and the Psycho Semanticast and the Friday Nightmares uh, podcast and Kill the Cast and the podcast on Haunted Hill and uh, uh, Duncan and Bo Come Correct and Pick Six Movies. Uh, I always forget to mention the shows I do other than uh, Dark Parade, so... Um, yeah, a lot of stuff over there, enough to, to keep you occupied at work or on your commutes uh, or, you know, when you're cleaning a basement after a particularly messy murder, any of those things. Like, that will keep you company during all of those things. Um, so, hey, we're, uh, we've are we got about a week left of, uh, of movies to cover before uh, Halloween hits and uh, lots to do, lots to do. So, I think you're going to love it. Uh, I know I'm going to enjoy it, and I hope you come along for more of that ride. Thank you very much for uh, listening to all of the 31 days of Halloween. Or if you're picking and choosing the movies you want to listen to, uh, thanks for doing that, too. It's fine. All are welcome. Step into the light, children. All are welcome. There is peace in the light. Uh, And there is peace in the 31 days of Halloween as well. So uh, enough out of me. Go have yourselves a very spooky day, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.